We're about to begin a new unit on nucleophilic substitution and elimination reactions. These two reaction types are related in that they involve the same types of reactants and involve analogous or similar electron flows. The beauty of nucleophilic substitution and elimination is that they provide a wonderful rich context to apply the principles that we've seen in previous lessons in order to deepen our understanding of the link between organic structure and reactivity. Structure and reactivity are related. This is why we can use drawings, reaction schemes that include only information about structure to make predictions about how reactions will occur. And we're going to do that a lot in this series of lessons. Specifically, we're going to make predictions about whether substitution or elimination will be preferred. And within those two types of reactions, we'll look at two different types of mechanisms, bimolecular and unimolecular mechanisms, and explore the structural differences and other details of reaction conditions that can influence the bimolecular versus unimolecular pathways. In this first lesson on substitution and elimination, we're just going to confine ourselves to substitution. Let's start with a few definitions that are important to understand for nucleophilic substitution reactions. Here's a general scheme for a nucleophilic substitution reaction. They're called nucleophilic substitutions because the reaction involves the exchange of one nucleophile, here drawn in red, for another, here drawn in blue, on the product side. One nucleophile displaces X, leaving X minus as a product, which in the reverse direction acts as a nucleophile to return us to the starting materials. This is why this is called nucleophilic substitution. There are three types of atoms or groups that are important to focus on in nucleophilic substitutions, and they're denoted here in red, black, and blue in this general reaction scheme. The electron pair donor, the reactant molecule that donates a pair of electrons to form a new bond to R in the product, is known as the nucleophile. In this general scheme, the nucleophile is drawn in red. The atom that accepts the pair of electrons from the nucleophile, in other words, where the curved arrow ends that starts from the nucleophilic lone pair within the nucleophile, is called the electrophile. In this general scheme, the electrophile is R. R may be part of a carbon group, it may be a carbon atom, or it may be some other type of heavy atom, for example, sulfur or phosphorus. The group that departs from the electrophilic molecule with a pair of electrons, that is, the group that becomes a nucleophile on the product side, is known as the leaving group or nucleophuge. It's a nucleophuge because it takes a pair of electrons with it at some point in the course of the mechanism, breaking off from R. In this general scheme, as you probably surmised, X is known as the leaving group or nucleophuge. You'll sometimes hear X minus referred to as the leaving group as well, and this is really just a semantic difference. Keep in mind here that R, the atom bound to the leaving group in the electrophile, and the electrophilic atom in the sense that R is the atom that accepts electrons from the nucleophile, is always tetrahedral. It's often carbon, but it doesn't have to be. It can be sulfur, nitrogen, oxygen, or in theory, any other heavy atom. Because of the way electron flow works in this process, with the nucleophile donating a lone pair, the nucleophile increases in formal charge by one unit. For the same reason, the leaving group decreases in charge by one unit, since it takes on an additional non-bonding lone pair of electrons where it previously had a bond. And a very important concept that I want to get out there right off the bat is that nucleophilic substitution reactions are analogous to Bronsted acid base processes. And this is the other reason we're studying them now. There is a beautiful analogy between electron flow and proton transfer processes, which we already talked about in an acid base context, and nucleophilic substitutions. The only difference between the two is in the nature of the electrophilic atom in black, the atom accepting electrons from the nucleophile. In a nucleophilic substitution process, the nucleophile donates a pair of electrons to some heavy atom, usually carbon. But notice that in a Bronsted acid base or proton transfer process, the exact same type of electron flow applies with a lone pair being donated to an atom and a group connected to that atom departing with a pair of electrons. The only thing that's changed is that the atom accepting the pair from the nucleophile is no longer carbon or some other heavy atom, but hydrogen. We still end up with a new bond between the electrophile and nucleophile, whose electrons came from the nucleophile, 
and we end up with a group with a new pair of electrons and a formal charge that's decreased by one unit that we previously called a conjugate base, but in the nucleophilic substitution context we refer to as a leaving group or nucleophuge. This deep analogy between proton transfer and nucleophilic substitution, which we'll abbreviate as S sub n, has profound implications. It means that we can use ideas about the basicity of the nucleophile to make predictions about nucleophilic substitution reactions. We can also use ideas about the acidity of the conjugate acid of the leaving group to make predictions about nucleophilic substitution reactions. We'll see how these work in more detail later. For now, I want to impart on you the importance of this analogy between proton transfer and nucleophilic substitution. It allows us to use foundational ideas, most importantly the equilibrium acid-base properties of the nucleophile and leaving group, to make predictions about nucleophilic substitution processes. Nucleophilic substitutions are an excellent way to establish bonds between a heteroatom, which acts as the nucleophile, and a carbon, which acts as the electrophile. The products of these reactions often contain an electronegative heteroatom bearing a single bond to a carbon atom. However, we can use reactants that contain nucleophilic carbon and electrophilic carbon to establish carbon-carbon bonds as well. Here are a few examples of nucleophilic substitutions where the leaving group is set to Br- and we're varying the nucleophile. Notice in all of these examples that the nucleophile is some electron-rich species, some species that wants to give electrons away, and in the product, the new bond involves a pair of electrons originating at the nucleophile. For example, when hydroxide is used as the nucleophile, the result is an alcohol. When an alkoxide is used as a nucleophile, the result is an ether. The reactivity of thiohydroxide is exactly analogous to that of hydroxide, and we end up with a thiol in this case. And as you might imagine, a thiolate anion, which is analogous to an alkoxide, gives a sulfide, the sulfur analog of an ether, as a product. Acetylide anions are commonly used as carbon nucleophiles in nucleophilic substitution reactions, and the product in this case is an alkyne, where the new carbon-carbon bond is a single bond that has come from a lone pair in the original acetylide reactant. Cyanide is a nitrogen analog of an acetylide anion and leads us to a nitrile product containing a carbon-nitrogen triple bond. Halide anions are commonly used as nucleophiles as well and leave us with alkyl halide products, a different alkyl halide from the one we started with. And finally, this last nucleophile looks a little bit odd, but notice that on the terminal nitrogens, it's negatively charged. This is the azid anion, and when this reacts in nucleophilic substitution reactions, the result is an alkyl azid.